everybody. You probably know I'm Helen and this is Hazel. Hazel's the guru and I'm the sidekick. I do the <laughs> lights and the introduction, but um, I'm very much a learner in terms of online stuff and Hazel's my teacher, as are my other colleagues at CTLI, but I'm interested in assessment, so Hazel and I did a session together for the introduction to teaching and learning, which Lara came to and we learned a lot from that, which is one of the things that's trying to do too much in a short period of time. Um, so my role has been to talk with Hazel about assessment principles and practices and to talk this through as she was getting it up there. So that, you know, very small role. But I'll just tell you about um, the symposium. We ended a three-day symposium on assessment and this was the only presentation I saw or heard of where people, where somebody gave a model that other people could take away and use. The rest of it was about theory and about research people are doing and so on. So um, we were surprised, weren't we, but that's just that, that there wasn't a strand of here are some good assessment practice ideas because a lot of it, there was no example. It was just talk at a higher level. So that was one thing about the conference. The second thing was that what I found, and there were people from universities around, the world, a lot of American people, British people and New Zealand people, that Unitech is right up there with everybody else in terms of our assessment practices and in terms of our quality assurance practices. So I go to those things thinking, oh, well, we're a polytech and there's all these flash universities. But in fact, we had one keynote from someone, David Carlos, from Hong Kong University. And this guy had yards of research and yards of um, publications and things that they were doing and it was all very impressive. And then the next day when he did his wind up, he said, actually, in my institution, everybody just does essays. So I think, now you tell us, you know, all this stuff that we've been saying before, he said, I'm trying to move them off essays and into other ways of assessment. But so, you know, I think we're, we're way ahead. So my bit at the conference was to explain to people what kind of institution we are, what kind of programs we do, and why online assessment is relevant to us as people who work with people going out into the workforce. So it's not like an academic theory kind of a thing that we do, that the theory is very much tied up with the practice. I talked to them about the range of qualifications that we teach and the fact that um, we start always when we, uh, ideally anyway, and in our work as advisors, this is what we advise people to do, when you're working out your assessments that you start with your graduate profile. So you're thinking of it in a holistic way. You look at the profile, what do we want to come out of this? And then down the line, with the profile as the end result, down the line, you're learning outcomes of your particular courses, which are all directed towards the profile. What I didn't tell them is that in practice, we find that a lot of people don't do their assessments like that. They do them piecemeal. Here's a topic, here's an assessment. So, um, but I told them that that's how we do it here. We have the graduate profile as our goal and we have the learning outcomes embedded within that as checkpoints. And um, that assessment, the other point, which came out a little bit of the conference, but I was surprised at how little it came out, that assessment is a learning tool, that it's not a stick to hit people with and it's not a way of getting marks so we can say, yes, you passed, now you failed. It's a learning tool, and that's how, in CTLI, we regard it and how we're hoping to um, persuade our colleagues to think of it if they're not thinking of it that way already. So what Hazel will show you is the most brilliant learning tool ever, and we had 35 minutes and Hazel kept missing slides and talking really fast, but she's going to be able to do a decent job of it this time round because she's got the time. Hopefully. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Okay. okay. Before I get going on what I'm going to talk about, there was, there was a couple of things that I wanted to mention. I was listening to this really great podcast yesterday, which is a source of inspiration constantly, and this um, uh, head of a university from America was talking. And he was, uh, his place is, is about 80% science, 
um, and he was talking about some of the ways they're using technology to help their students. And one of the first things that he said was, students come in to the university and he said it used to be that you'd sit there and there'd be three of you and the, the head was be doing the welcome and he'd said, okay, look to your right, look to your left, say goodbye to one of you because one of you aren't going to pass the first year. He said that's not so motivational. Um, and what they've tried to do is get their students to work collaboratively with a whole heap of um, scaffolding put in learning management systems and other different technology to encourage students to just problem solve and find things out together in that first year. And what they've found, instead of 60% getting through their first year, they've now got 80% getting through their first year, which is pretty good. Interestingly though, he said sometimes some students, the freshman students, found it horrendous when they first started. They're used to trotting off to their room and working by themselves. But if you look at some of the theories like sociocultural theory, um, which looks at how much you can improve your learning by working with other um, peers and more, more advanced peers, teachers, you, it sort of uh, means that you learn more sooner especially if that scaffolding's in place. The reason I'm sort of talking about all this is I'm going to talk about a situation and example from Dubai, but we had similar sort of experiences and similar sort of results. Another result that he was talking about was they looked at which students were getting C and D grades and what was one of the common factors. They found out that these students were using the scaffolding tools 35% less than the students getting A's and B's. It's not rocket science, I mean it makes common sense, um, but it's interesting that they've got the hard and fast data to, to say, okay, you use the tools, you will improve. And exactly the same um, as we found in Dubai. So what I'm going to do is very, very briefly look at a couple of the terms, blended learning and authentic assessment, and then move into the example. So you might have heard blended learning, hybrid learning, mixed learning, blended e-learning. They all pretty much used interchangeably. Um, hybrid learning is often used in um, industry and business in, and in training sessions. I quite like this um, uh, uh, meaning of blended learning because what it does is it looks at the interactions of students, not at tools, not at just on campus. It's looking at actually how they communicate, how they interact, um, and looks at how important that communication is between all <coughs> of the people involved. So when I mentioned blended learning today, um, this is what I'm referring to. And authentic assessment, we hear it all the time. Now, I, I'm a horse rider, hence, hence the horses. The reason I put these pictures up, not only are they rather lovely pictures, but I sort of thought, when I was learning to ride, we were on little hairy ponies popping over tiny jumps in a menage, a fenced area, and it was very safe. And our assessment, we had little assessments, it could be uh, a round with a rosette at the end or it could be a certificate, but same skills as the professional show jumper uses, but just at a much less sophisticated level. And then you go out and you practice some and the jumps get bigger and you maybe go to more assessments um, that are asking for more sophistication until maybe eventually you get to the professional level, where you're applying these skills in authentic situations, um, maybe in the workplace, um, or maybe in the community. So, authentic I see as you don't have to do it in the workplace. It doesn't have to be 100% exactly as it would be. You can ask for uh, or assess something with less sophistication, but the skill is still authentic. And something that students are coming more and more um, to us with, in fact, um, I can remember reading not so long ago, somebody was saying that knowledge, learning knowledge at um, tertiary institutions will soon be defunct. 
what you will do is you'll come along and you'll learn skills, um, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, how to communicate and collaborate with people. And that's our students, especially now uh, globalisation is more and more uh, at the forefront of people's minds. Maybe they won't be working in New Zealand, maybe they will be working somewhere else in the world. So they come to tertiary educations wanting skills that are transferable um, in New Zealand and outside and amongst uh, various different disciplines. So, moving on to Dubai. We had similar sort of problems, issues and concerns with our students in Dubai um, as I've seen in, in most tertiary institutions that I've worked in around the world. And there's issues with, for example, low levels of literacy and numeracy. There's problems with how you assess. What are you actually looking for? How do you design those assessments? Are, are they actually um, testing what we've taught? So, um, Dubai Men's College is where I was. I was working there for three and a half years. Uh, Dubai Men's College is part of the higher colleges of technology. There's 14 colleges, and there's men co men's colleges and women's colleges, and never the twain shall meet. Um, so, I was working with um, Emirati students, all male, mainly between um, 70 to 20 years old, 70% of them. 30% were working and mature students and they come in and they'd be studying in the evening. For the mature students in particular, having a blended learning approach was really important. So for example, one of our students went off to India for a month. Usually he'd have to stop his study and come back the next semester. But because we put this blended learning course together, he was able to um, continue to do all of his assignments, um, see all of the, uh, uh, in, uh, the sessions, the face-to-face -face sessions and so on, because they're all up there on the learning management system. One of the big problems that we faced with um, the students in Dubai was they came from quite a traditional teaching background. So very teacher-centred, um, lots of teacher at the front saying exactly what you should do and when you should do it. So things like critical thinking skills, questioning skills, um, and self-direction was, yeah, it was non-existent pretty much. So we couldn't really, uh, the students came to us and we were looking for these self-directed skills and we couldn't just go, away you go, be self-directed. We had to scaffold them from where they came to us to where we wanted them to be once they got onto the degree courses. From that, you probably guessed that I was teaching um, in foundations. Um, one of the things that really helped us with the blended learning approach was when I first got to, to um, Dubai Men's College, we had labs, but then after a year, uh, the college decided that it should be mandatory for all students to have laptops. Hooray! And wireless access was across the entire campus, um, and the uh, college realised that some students might not be able to afford laptops, so it put together grants that students could apply for to buy them. Now, um, when I first got to Dubai Men's College in Foundations, there were um, four main courses, Arabic, Math, English, and Computer, and something called um, Projects. And they were very much standalone courses. Each had their own assessment. What happened was, in the projects course, once a week they'd get a, a, an hour maybe on referencing or um, how to do research and then they were expected to take those skills and apply them and they weren't. <coughs> we also found that students, because of the amount of assessments that they had to do, were incredibly overloaded and we ended up, for example, with the projects getting 3,000 copy-pasted words off the internet handed in. So not, not much learning going on. So what we did was we thought, OK, how can we pull all of these together and start getting things like crossover assessment and really make it explicit? If you're learning skills here, how do 
how are you going to apply them here? If you're learning skills here, then you should be being asked to apply them here. So we really wanted to get something that was quite dynamic and definitely interlinked. We also had the graduate outcomes. We had um, generic graduate outcomes for the whole college, but we also had foundations graduate outcomes, which looked at things like um, the critical and creative thinking, global awareness, and so on. So we kept these very much in mind when designing the course and the assessments around it. Now, this, this is something um, that I really want to emphasize. These are the assessments. They had two summative assessments. One was a 10 minute group presentation and one was a website. They also had what we called an ongoing assessment. This was formative. They had a completion <coughs> mark. Um, so whenever they finished a piece of work, they'd get a certain percentage of their overall assessment was given for the completion of that work. As, lo as long as it was a, a reasonable standard. There was no grade associated with that. What there was, though, was a lot of feedback, and each of the tasks here, you'll see in a sec, I'll show you a diagram, was cumulative towards the final summative assessment. So it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Each bit of the jigsaw puzzle made a part of the final picture. The summative assessments were in part formative as well because they had we, we gave feedback again because students would be applying these in higher diploma and the degrees that they graduated to. So 40 week course over one year. They did four projects. We designed four projects. I'm just going to show you one of the projects. This was done in the beginning of the second semester. Here are the skills that were part of the learning outcomes. These were the cumulative formative tasks and activities. And these were the final assessments that they got some sort of grade with, apart from the quizzes. Nice bit of color coding. So the first thing that we looked at was vocabulary. And these students were um, second language English speakers and the uh, language of the college was English. So all of the tuition was done in English. So they had to be pretty, pretty high level. So one of the first things that we thought, okay, vocabulary, they're gonna need specific vocabulary for careers. Um, so what we did was initially students would have a list of words and they were encouraged to um, translate it as well as uh, uh, do some quizzes and things around it. Now the main thing was though that this was at the very beginning. They were then asked to produce the vocabulary in the presentations, in the websites, in the autobiographies, so they used it again and again. Um, and one of the students wrote in the feedback at the end that he found that he hadn't just learned the vocabulary, he knew how to use it. Um, so that was a, a big step forward because he, was, he sort of became aware of um, some of the meta skills as well. Research. Research was a huge problem for our students. Um, they'd, you've got the internet out there, you've got the library, you've got uh, books, magazines, all around you. And students would come to us and we'd give them, say, career project. Okay, go and do some research. They'd go, where do we start? So we thought um, one of the ways of scaffolding this was to put together a fact sheet. So it was sort of just our areas that indicated um, ways or topics that they could start to research that they might find useful. Um, so for each of the projects they had fact sheets so they became quite au fait with using them. Now having collected all of this we then wanted to give them sort of the next step. What do you do with all this research? Um, so they would take these research, these fact sheets, um, and they'd do an in-class writing. So they'd have a rubric, and they'd have to write, uh, using this research and the information from that research, an essay. 
We used rubrics a lot. So this was the rubric that went with that <laughs> essay. The rubrics were discussed in class, and it's a bit of a blunt instrument. You can see here it's, it's very much sort of five and seven misspellings, so it's really sort of distilled down. But what we wanted to do was make it really clear to the students exactly what we were looking for, and therefore um, make it very transparent how they were going to be assessed. Part um, of the career project was uh, an autobiography. Again, with the autobiography, you can see that you've got a whole heap of skills that they were um, recycling. And the autobiography, they did a write-up, but it, they could also present on it, and it was part of their career portfolio, the website that they came up with at the end. As I mentioned, the autobiography lots of formative feedback. We did most of our marking online, so we used track changes and things like that um, to help students. Um, and this is just an example of one of the curriculum vitae that they came up with. Again, very not, not very sophisticated, but it was foundations level, and it's something they can build on as they go through the college. This is an example of the autobiography in the final website. Um, simple, but... Uh, quite, quite a lot of good detail there, reasonably well written, and you can see that somebody's worked on the draft a couple of times. And another thing that we have problems with, some students were told, okay, son, you're off to college. And they come to college, they're in foundations, they wouldn't have a clue what they wanted to do. And they didn't really have the analytical skills to work out what course would actually fit their interests and skills, and also what they wanted to do in the future. So we put together a sort of a decision analysis type scaffolding task. Um, what they do is they go into the learning management system. So this is hypothetical Ali. These are his skills. Um, and these are the courses, on, well, some of the courses on offer at the, the college. They can listen to this as well, just to, for, those, for those students who prefer audio. And what they had to do is match these skills with the best course. And then you get together and you discuss, well, why did you think that? And do you think Ali would be happy with that? Do you think he'd end up doing a job that he'd like at the end of it? And we also, um, some students were invited onto a local radio station, which was really great. And um, we recorded it and podcasted it. So you've got that authentic sort of listening type feel. And these students are great. People would ring in and say, well, well, why do you want to do this particular, why do you want to do aviation? And some of the students would say, because my father wants me to, or because I love flying, or I watched um, Top Gun when I was 10, or <laughs> all, all of the usual reasons. So students were asked to listen to this and fill in this sheet. Again, another step that we're pulling to the, together the jobs, the reasons, and the skills. For the final assessment, the summative assessment, students then had to do a little summary of the course that they thought they might want to do. Um, and this is just an example that I've popped up here because this guy was really interested in highway maintenance. And so he organised a site visit, took his mates along, and these are some of the photos that were taken. They, they were shown uh, the new airport in Dubai. And um, so it was just going that extra mile because he was all of a sudden interested with his skills, where he wanted to go, and he just wanted to find out a little bit more. So that, that was fascinating. We also got students to go and talk to people who are actually working. Plus, this is where we brought in math. So we had a little scaffolding task to get students to start to think about things like um, ratios, and uh, business and where math might fit into business if you were going to go into that. And then students in groups of three would set off to the local shopping mall and if you've ever been to Dubai it's quite an experience um, and they'd uh, have a list of questions and some of the questions would be um, what's your nationality, where do you work, how many years have you been working and then they'd come back and they'd put all of this into a spreadsheet, collate it, analyse it, summarise it. Again, 
very, very uh, low sophistication, but it was application of research skills. And then um, there was a math, a math task directly associated with that that had to go on the website. Emiratization. This is uh, a biggie for students who obviously are working in the um, Emirates. What it is, it's uh, the government is trying to get more Emiratis out in the workforce. At the moment, I think there's something like 3% uh, of Emiratis uh, make up the workforce and the rest is all expats. So they're putting together quite a lot of incentives, um, especially in the government sectors. So one of the things, as an Emirati, it's important to know because it's important to know but also, if you are keen on some of those incentives, then maybe you need to choose a government sector job. Um, if you're not so keen on some of those incentives and you would like different incentives, then maybe you needed a private sector job. So it was something that we thought um, was pretty important for students. So again, scaffolding, we started off with some reading, some vocabulary. Um, a math task around it, looking at uh, ratios and percentages. And um, in the summative task, they had to sort of give an overview of what they thought emiratization was and why it was important to Emiratis and why it was important to them. Last bit. <laughs> For the final career portfolio, the website, to be considered for an A+, plus, we had an extra page or task that they could choose to do. So if they're already snowed under and they were quite happy with whatever grade they got, then they didn't have to do this. It wasn't mandatory. Um, and what it was, you went out and you contacted an alumnus and you arranged an interview. So there's lots of different skills here as well, soft skills. And you went along and you talked to them about what they were doing um, what they did in college that they found useful, how they were successful, how, what did they do that meant that they graduated, and how are they using some of the skills that they learned. And this is just an example of um, one of the guys that was um, interviewed and the, the write-up that the student did afterwards on his website. We also wanted all the way through we had um, we recycled a lot of the skills, such as avoidance of plagiarism skills, summarisation, um, synonyms, use of synonyms, um, referencing, and so on and so forth. So for every single thing that students handed in, there had to be a reference list. We got them to reference images. We got them to. We also wanted to highlight that um, the research that they did independently was important. So we got them to reference things like personal interviews that they sought. Um, and I'd say that in comparison with projects before, we actually started to get some reasonably um, formatted reference lists and near enough every single student had some form of reference list. We also had a little thing in there where if there was any plagiarism, um, they get a zero but they could rewrite and resubmit. This is just an example of the whole career portfolio put together. So you'll see all of those cumulative tasks that we just went through are here. They're all part of it. So this could be second, third, fourth draft. There's been peer input. There's been teacher input. Um, and yeah, they pull it all together. The this is a very basic e-portfolio. It's uh, put together for assessment, um, and now I do it quite differently. But at the time, um, it, it, it formed its purpose. We also, uh, for example, one of the students went out and showed a prospective employer their uh, website, their e-portfolio, and ended up with a summer job off the back of it. So it was quite a powerful tool. As I mentioned, um, rubrics, same sort of idea as for the in-class writing. Uh, you've got the awareness of plagiarism, the vocabulary coming up. Uh, you've got uh, very simple things as well, like the number of pages. Um, but we did do things like ex discussing class 
Okay, so five pages. Do you think there has to be something written on them type discussions? So uh, students did actually, they were aware that even though it just said five pages, there did have to be a quality of work issue in there. The group presentations, um, we got math teachers, English teachers, computer teachers and research skills and projects teachers to mark the presentations so our tool had to be uh, quite transparent and easy to use and this is what we came up with and you'll see it's a mix of um, presentation skills uh, about the content and down the bottom that you can't see there was uh, some uh, research skills that were also graded. Alongside this, um, this ran over four years, we had 810 students. I'm not going to talk too much about the research study. Um, I've written it up and if you're interested I can send you a copy of the uh, write-up. I just wanted to say that what we found was that there was a couple of really good things. One was students were really getting it. They were um, realising that the skills they were learning were transferable, that they would need to use them uh, once they got out of foundations. And the second thing was we had higher diploma teachers come to us and say, what have you done to the students? They're brilliant. Um, because we've got direct entry students and we've got students who came up through foundations. And in comparison, I have one teacher just sit me down and talk for, for ages about how the direct entry students' presentations were dire in comparison with the foundation students who were coming through. So the students got it and realised that they would continue to apply um, the skills as they went along. The course was, uh, uh, yeah, it was very successful. We ended up with an um, uh, uh, award, a Nikkei Award for Innovation, and we were also a finalist in the um, Education uh, IT Challenge in the UAE which is kind of cool. Um, what I'd like to just say though is it was a big task. Um, in fact, it was a huge task. We started with a pilot and then for the three, three years following um, ran the course. It transformed from research skills and projects to computer research skills and projects. The crossover assessment was refined and interestingly um, faculty at the beginning who at the beginning were going why do we want to do this I hate this this is an awful idea after a year or two we're going wow this is this is much better the students are producing one product which the English teachers would assess the math teachers would assess for the math content the computers for the computer content and the research folk for the research content and rather than overloading the students and getting sort of 10 different uh, variable quality um, assessments, we had the one with all of these um, other uh, ways of assessing it. However, that's, that's kind of big and you need to get a whole heap of people on board. But I, I believe that you can start at a small level and, and get bigger. So even if you just work with one assessment and think, okay, here are the learning outcomes, here are the graduate outcomes. What do I need to assess? How can I scaffold this? How can I get students to work together? And what sort of tools can I use to help this process? And then, if you, if you do it like that, the focus very much is on the pedagogy and, and not the tools. There's so many tools out there, it's, it can be mind-blowing. Um, so if you focus on the learning outcomes and the graduate profiles to begin with, and then start to think about your assessments. Um, if you're interested, I have a bit of a design model that I've put together, the ICT Enhanced Learning and Teaching Model, um, and I can come and talk and help you out with uh, your assessments designed if you'd like. Um, if you want to find out more about that model, this is it's in PD Wiki, you can go and have a look. Um, Helen and I also put together some resources for assessment which are in the Moodle and you can log in with the username assess2008 and the password is also assess2008. So, um, I've just about finished. So has anyone got any questions please? Hey, so what did you use for the uh, website? What, did you do an arrangement? 
we, um, we actually started with front page um, in the first year, but it was, it was such a, it didn't have enough uh, functionality, so we ended up using Dreamweaver and changed uh, our overall college assessments to reflect that change. Any other questions? Did you have any form of peer assessment if they were working in groups on their assignment on their project? Absolutely, absolutely. We that was actually kind of quite a difficult thing to start to get students to do. We had to sit down and discuss first of all, it's the teacher's job to mark this. So we went through all of that. But with the rubrics we were using, they were um, transparent enough for students to also use and what we tried to do is also give them model feedback um, so they could kind of see oh so I need to mention this and this and then they could uh, work quite flexibly within that framework but yeah and and some of the students did say that it was it was a great way of learning their own mistakes by assessing their peers <laughs> Sources mostly, the internet, or do they end up actually <coughs> with articles, books? We, we actually chose some uh, subjects, like uh, for the first project they did was called the Country Project, and although there's quite a lot on the internet about that, um, we had a whole heap of books down in the library that were specific to that project, so we take all of the students down there and encourage them to start to use the um, resources in the library. And we also, we had the whole discussion on why, yeah, around why that would be such a good idea. And what, what we found <coughs> was, because we were using the resources in class, we were using the learning management system on class, so I'd be talking away and, and uh, WebCT would be up here with the course. We get the students to access the learning management system in class and use some of the tools in class. So we, was, we were training them in class before we expected them to use it outside. So it became second nature. This is where we find most of the things that we need. Yes. Have you got a feeling for what contributed most to the success of this? Was it to do with um, the assessment being relevant, authentic and timely? Or was it the online? Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, the online enhanced the access. It kind of made it a bit more sexy, if you like. Um, they could they could find things easily, and uh, they kind of eventually expected a certain level of, of tools up there. However, if the assessment hadn't been relevant and timely, and they could see how it all fitted together and so on, I don't think it would have worked just with the tools if then at the end we said okay go write a 3,000 word essay right. so the other side of that it's relevant authentic and timely but you weren't using this online do you think it would have been significantly differently received probably not probably not it just would not have been so accessible for students and some of the scaffolding that we put in place, so there's a whole heap of multimedia that we were using, um, that would have been more difficult to, to give to students. So I'd say some of the tools we were using, maybe they wouldn't need to have been online necessarily, but um, I wouldn't have let go of the tools that we, that we, that we were using. Yes. Um, you're using the word we. Is that, was that you and colleagues as well? And how many courses as well were you designing from scratch, I assume? Uh, it was, initially it was just me and I was teaching uh, 200 students and um, designing the course. There were sort of, from the projects that existed before, there was um, sort of uh, the topic had already been um, identified but the skills around it hadn't really. So I worked really closely with high diploma faculty, with the library, with um, all of the other stakeholders, the computer teacher, and tried to pull together the whole kit and caboodle. The next year, having nearly gone completely mental rewriting this course and teaching it, um, we did end up with a team. And 
interestingly, from what I was saying earlier about students collaborating, what then happened was the bare bones of what I'd come up with. People came on board and they were going, ah, oh, so we, if we did this like this, then that would happen. And it was just, oh, it was a breath of fresh air. It was fantastic. Um, very uh, creative. Um, and also it meant that I didn't have to do quite so much overtime. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you just go back? Um, one of your earlier slides, you talked about your formative assessment. Yes. You said there was no grade given, yes. but a completion mark given along the way. Can you just a bit confused about how that worked? So what we would do, say they were writing their autobiography, and they'd write their autobiography, type it up, <coughs> upload it into WebCT. So in WebCT we could see that it was uploaded, they'd uploaded it on time, so we were looking at time management skills as well. Um, and that, uh, that it was complete. So as soon as it was up there in WebCT and it was complete and it was on time, they'd get a, 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 a grade, well, not a grade, a sort of a percentage. Um, it would be 100% of whatever it was weighted at. <laughs> if it was late, we then started to knock off points so that after the fourth day, the whole lot closed and they weren't allowed, allowed to upload unless they had sort of a doctor's certificate. Um, so that's that's how we worked it. And then you gave the feedback, and then that task then went there. So once you gave the feedback, they then could draft it and resubmit if they wanted to. That was up to but them. There's no marks for the, for the content; it's just marks for getting it there on time. That's right, because what we thought is they get the feedback and they'd be given a grade in the final summative assessment, so it, well, it was pointless grading it twice. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, I just have any thoughts. Um, I mean, if your assessment rubric is looking absolutely at the transparency of the students, but um, whether it's a good idea or to have you think of it sort of an almost a discussion of the tutor's discussion, so if you have a student who perhaps doesn't meet one aspect, but because they have we we did have we had wriggle room within a couple of the the um, areas so some were very clear cut it was between this and this or this number of words or but some of the wriggle room for example so if it was 350 of somebody else's words um, obviously that was a zero if it was 350 beautifully crafted words that were incredibly relevant um, and insightful, then you could give the whole of that, um, that mark. Um, but if they were 350 words that weren't insightful and relevant, you could kind of decide to give half of them. And you could discuss with the student why this might be the case. Um, so students would come to us and say, well, well, wh why did I get this? I got 350 words. And that was the beautiful point where um, learning could happen because they'd come with the question. <coughs> any, any other questions? The maths, all, all of the, interestingly, all of the maths, um, we worked closely with the, the maths team and they came up with all of the tasks. They also assessed all of the tasks. So there would be a maths aspect to a lot of the things like the interviews, so the data they'd look at um, and then apply. What one of the um, maths teachers I can remember t telling me, they'd just done an assessment where they just went through number one, number two, number three, and uh, one of the questions was about percentages. And the teacher had marked these, put the raw score down the end, and one of the students came up and said, ah, sir, what's, what's the percentage? What percentage did I get? So this is, <coughs> this is where we decided that we needed to build in assessments that got students to not only learn their skills, but then work out why they were useful and how to apply them. So things like um, the, uh, the decision analysis around which career they were going to do. So how many, how many people were in that profession? Um, what uh, ratio of people were between this age and this age? So it's quite simple um, applications of con mathematical concepts, um, but 
it was the application that was that was there that was important. Does does that answer your question? Yeah. Fantastic. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. <laughs> what, what we're finding actually um, at, at Unitech at the moment, what we're doing is we're going to see people and tailoring workshops to their discipline or to their requirements. So at the moment, for example, we're working with the School of Natural Sciences and we go along and uh, we run a uh, workshop, say, on alternative online assessments, which we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had 10 people come along, quite a few a little, little bit sceptical. Um, at the end of the workshop, they were inspired, nine of them anyway. One went away to think about it. And we've since then started working closely with two, and other people are very interested. So I think it's just kind of that mixture of going along and having inspirational input at just the right time, and then those people who then follow up and say, Oh, I'd like to go down that, and then they become your champions. Um, but I think also having a, a centre like the uh, like CTLI, where you can choose to work closely with somebody, you've got that initial support and training. That's an essential aspect as well. Any any other questions? Fantastic. Well, Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for giving up your lunch break. <laughs>